Hi, this is JP Morgan. Today on The Slanted Lens, we're going to start a series called The Laws of Light. These were principles that were taught to me by Charlie Potts at Art Center. He was the head of the photo department at Art City College of Design. I was taught these principles. I've been building on them for 25 years, and I'm now going to pass them on to you. These truly are the laws of light, the things that happen every time you turn on a light. You can't change them. You can't make them go away, but you can control them and use them to your advantage. So let's see what they are. Let's see how you can apply them to your work and let's really see the laws of light in action. So let's get started and see what we can do. If you've not signed up for our business coaching class, it's time to take a look at what the materials there can do for you. We've got 16 hours of materials that will help you to change the direction of your business, organize it, and get new clients. We we'll also have once a month you get to mentor with me where you call in, we'll talk about the issues you're facing and help you overcome them and help you to move forward. So go to thuslinerlens.com and sign up for our business coaching class today. Let me help you out. Remember, the camera is not your tool. It's the object that simply records the light that you place in front of it. Without light, the camera can't work. So our tool as photographers, as videographers, is light. Every time a photographer or a videographer starts to light something, they have to decide where to set the light. So let's talk about angle of light. If I take this light right here and I set it at camera angle, which is zero to camera, and I turn it on, I get a very flat subject. There is no dimension. It's a round circle without dimension. It's a white round circle. All I have to do is to move this light off from camera axis and dimension starts to be created. As I move it around off from camera angle now, we've gone from zero to about 60 degrees we now have five things that have happened. Every time we turn on a light, these five things happened. When I put the light at camera angle directly at the light, the five things happened, but they happened away from the camera. The camera didn't have the opportunity to see them. But when I move the light around into a nicer angle and turn it on, the five things happen on our ball here. Let's talk about the five things. First off, we have a highlight side. We have an incident highlight. We have a core which is a transitional area from the highlight to the shadow side. And then we have a cast shadow. Those are the five things. Highlight is simply that, the area that is lit by our light. The incident angle is the angle of our light off the subject and the incident angle to the camera. The core is a transition from light, light to dark. It's the area where the transition starts to happen. Then the shadow side is after the transition has completed itself and now we are simply on a shadow side. The drop shadow is a shadow dropped onto the surface that our subject sits on or onto the subjects around it if there's more than one subject in a photograph. Those five things happen every single time you turn on a light. There's no way you can avoid it. But what you can do is use them to your advantage. You can put this core where you'd like it to be. You can change its position. Like I say, as I move this light around, that core is there but we get to change where and how it's used. We have our highlight, our incident highlight, our core, our shadow side, and our drop shadow. We still have that dimension. Our light is up and behind. Even if I get this light up really high and directly overhead, all five of those things are still happening. We still have our, our highlight, our shadow, and our core. So this creates dimension. It creates the, the shadow. The ball that was absolutely flat when the light was right at the camera now has great dimension and is circular. Photography is a two-dimensional experience in a three-dimensional world. This is a three-dimensional object, but if it's lit incorrectly, it looks one-dimensional. If it's lit correctly, it now has a three-dimensional quality, even though we're looking at it in a two-dimensional experience. So now, looking at these five things that happen every time, let's look them in context of different qualities of light. This is a directional light, a strong pinpoint light. This light is a single small source. It's going to have a harder core and a fast fall off from highlight to shadow because it's very directional. That's how you can tell how hard a light is, is how quickly does it fall off from highlight to shadow. The stronger and more pinpoint the source is, the quicker it's going to fall off to shadow. The softer and the more soft a source is, it's going to fall off much slower and it's going to become bright 
to slowly into dark. And that's a much softer transition. That's how you can tell a softer or a more diffused light. So let's look at this with a diffused light. We now have that same wonderful five things that are happening. They're just happening here in a different way. We still have a highlight. We still have an incident highlight. We have a core, but look how soft this core is. It is not very hard at all. It's, it's so hard to tell as that highlight wraps around into the shadow side and our, look at our, our drop shadow is very soft. It's got a bleed around it on both sides. So all those five things are happening, but in a much softer sort of way. So that's a much softer light. You know, there are things that love both of these types of light. You know, there are subject matters that love hard directional light. They used to say cars could only be shot in that, that you know, end of the day, beautiful light. And then photographers went out and said, look, I'm going to shoot cars in direct sun. And they look beautiful. That sheet metal responds to direct sun if it's shot correctly. So you can do some really interesting things with hard directional light. And there are some subject matters that just cry for it. They want it. And there's others that need softer that need nicer light. And so you have to make as a decision as a photographer as what do I want to communicate about my subject and what type of light am I going to use. So we have our nice soft light from the side. We can do the same thing by putting a soft light in from above. So look how soft this transition is. We've got the highlight, we've got the incident highlight, we've got that core, we've got almost have no transition. It just kind of slowly falls off to that and then the drop shadow on the, on the uh, ground. But a beautiful light, I mean, these are done with soft boxes, with octodomes. These are things, this is a type of light that is very common and certainly one that people use a lot uh, these days. It really is kind of the go-to light for people. They put up a soft box and makes you have really soft light on people's faces because you see this beautiful soft highlight into shadows. So let's talk about what creates different qualities of light. A hard pinpoint source of light comes from a light bulb, a bulb, something very small and concentrated. The sun is so far away that it's a small source of light. A soft light comes from something large, a large source. This light right here sees around the ball. The reason this is soft on the left hand side is because this side of the reflector is reflecting light into this side of the ball. If there's a pinpoint source it can't see around the ball but a large source does. It reflects around the ball because it's large. So it's that large soft area that creates a soft light. Light can't look around corners. It can simply have a bigger source that allows light to be able to spill around the corner. So there's a big difference. A pinpoint source can only see from one spot. A big source allows you to see around and softens the light on the person's face or on the ball. So there's different ways to create soft light. Bouncing and reflecting or pinpoint is just directional, aim straight at the source. So we've used a single light to create dimension using our highlight, instant highlight, core, shadow, and drop shadow but now we may want to create separation. Using the same light, we simply pan it onto the background and we've now created separation with our light. We have a highlight side, which is separated from the shadow side of the background. We have a shadow side that's separated from the highlight side of the background. So with that single light, we've created dimension in our subject matter. It no longer looks flat, it's very round. And we've created separation from our background so that it no longer sits in a one-dimensional experience, but now has become more three-dimensional because it's separated from the background. So light creates separation. We could easily do this as well. By adding a second light. This second light now does the very same things. We have the highlight and shadow, we've got the highlight and shadow, and it creates that separation from the background. Adding a second light gives us the option to create separation not just by value but also by color. We could change the color of that background light. That would create separation as well. We also could turn that light into a rim light and create separation by putting a rim on the side of our subject matter. We still have our three-dimensional experience here but we've got what's called a crossover core. I call it a crossover core. You've got your core here but now you've got a core rolling in from the back that crosses over again. It's really important that you put that light in the, the right place for that to work. I think on this ball becomes too complicated. It's better to have that simple highlight to shadow. But on people's faces, that rim light can look very nice as you get a rim in the hair in an area that you want to give it a little rim light to separate from the background. So that's a way to separate as well. Now we've got great separation. and We, we may decide, you know what, I really want the, the shadow side of my subject matter to be a little brighter. All we have to do is simply bring in a fill card and we get to decide now how much, what's the ratio we want? A one to two ratio, that means a, a one stop difference. A one to three ratio, which is three stops. So the closer we get this in, 
we can almost get it to where it erases our core, almost erases our shadow side. But as we pull it out, the ratio becomes stronger. We go to a one to two, to a one to a three. It becomes a little stronger as we take that fill card out. So we get to decide how we want to communicate with that shadow side of our subject matter and how much fill we want to have in there. The easiest way for us to fill in the side of our subject matter is with a bounce fill. It takes the light that's coming in and it just takes that same light and puts a portion of it back onto the subject matter. When we add a second light here, we add a second core that's going to cause problems for us. So we don't want to create a second light and add a second light source. It's just easier to use a simple reflector. So that becomes almost a, a go-to or a simple setup for a photographer, for a videographer. You've got a key light, you've got your shadow and your highlight and your core. Then you add a reflector on that one light back in that creates the ratio that you like. And then a simple light on the background that creates separation for you. You can get away with this as you turn it in as a single light doing both of those things, but it gives you two different ways to work with a one or two light setup. Let's look at some images that represent photographing a sphere. There's the laws of light as they relate to a sphere. You know, everything in the world is a sphere, a cube, or a cylinder. In our next lesson, we're going to look at a cube and how that relates to the laws of light. Eventually, when we understand all three of these, there isn't anything that we can't light. So join us for the next in our series on the laws of light on how to light a cube. So keep those cameras rolling, keep on clicking. We've got a great download we're offering here at the Sun Lens called Stop Motion Basics for Beginners. Trisha Zemp takes all the information she's learned on how to do stop motion from how to shoot the stop motion to how to edit it and post it and put music to it on Instagram or YouTube. It's a fabulous journey where she'll teach you everything you need to know to be able to do stop motion. If you're interested in stop motion, this is going to teach you the process and what you need to do. So go to thuslenlens.com slash stop motion to get your copy today. Subscribe to The Slender Lens, like all my buddies here did. You can come and hang out with us. We have a wild time together, me and my buddies here, my mannequin buddies. We have a great time together. So come and join The Slender Lens, subscribe. You can be friends with us too.